There's no doubt this monster helicopter can lift a single dollar bill, but the question is, how many can it lift? Welcome back to Engineered Best. Today's line is 35.1 single dollar bills, so I'm attaching 36, and it's your job to take the over if you think it can lift this, and the under if you think it can't. When I got this fresh stack of dollar bills from the bank, the teller probably thought I was in for a fun night, and boy were they right because nothing beats comparing theory to reality, but if you don't want to see the beauty behind calculating this line, you can skip ahead to this timestamp to just see the results, but know you're missing out. Anyway, the first step to setting this line was estimating the maximum amount of lift that the helicopter can produce. And to do that, I'll first look at a single blade and even more specifically, a single cross section of the single blade. To estimate the lift force on just this cross section, I first need to know the dynamic pressure of the fluid. This accounts for the type of fluid that the blade is flying through, which in this example is the density of air, and it accounts for the velocity of the fluid relative to the blade that's spinning. You also need to account for the shape of the cross section of the blade to determine how that shape will interact with the air as it moves. This is accounted for using the lift coefficient, which is a value that can be looked up. Lastly, to account for the actual size or width of this cross section, you need to know its chord, which is the distance from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the blade measured parallel to the direction of the fluid flow. Combining all these terms and you get the lift force for this particular slice of the wing. So from a different angle, maybe I look at a cross section near the tip of the wing and I find values for all these terms at that point, and that gives me the lift force at that cross section. The lift force at the tip is not the same as it is at every other cross section, like here, 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 or here, where it's decreasing as you get closer to the point of rotation. This is primarily due to the fact that the blade is rotating in circular motion, which means the tip of the blade is traveling the fastest and the velocity decreases as you get closer to the rotor. So to get the total lift force on the blade, I need to integrate the lift force at each cross section with respect to the radius. Plugging in all those terms for the cross sectional lift force, and now we've got the final equation that we need to solve. Before I can actually integrate, I need to make sure that each term is expressed as a function of radius to account for the fact that some of these terms are changing as you go along the blade. One half is obviously a constant, so that's fine as is, and the density of air will be the same no matter where you are along the blade, so it's also a constant. I can look up this value and see that it's 1.1 kilograms per meter cubed for air at about 1,000 meters above sea level, which is where the trial will happen. Next, the lift coefficient. The lift coefficient only depends on the cross-sectional shape of the object, which appears to be about the same the whole way through, so I'll also say this is a constant. I could normally look up a value for this shape and orientation, but since it appears to be a pretty thin airfoil with a relatively small angle of attack of 12 degrees, I'll approximate the lift coefficient using a common approximation, which is 2 pi alpha, where alpha is the angle of attack. Converting 12 degrees to radians, plugging it in, and I get that the lift coefficient is about 1.3. Next, the velocity term, which is a bit more complicated. As mentioned, because the blade is rotating in circular motion, the linear velocity of the air relative to the blade is different depending on where you are along the blade. Luckily, I don't have to guess how this velocity relates to the radius because there's a simple relationship between velocity and radius for circular motion, which is that the velocity is equal to the angular velocity, which is how fast the blade is rotating, times the radius. I don't yet know how fast the blades are rotating, so I decided to strap down the helicopter to some wood blocks and weight it down to make sure it wasn't going anywhere. Then I turn the helicopter on, giving it max power to analyze. Looking at the blades in slow motion, and I see that each blade makes one full rotation in about 32 frames. Since my camera was recording at 960 frames per second, that comes out to an angular velocity of 188.5 radians per second, which is about 1800 RPM for those curious. Lastly, the cord, which is also not constant as you go along the blade. Looking from above, you can see there's two distinct sections. In the first section, the cord length is increasing in a roughly linear way. Then it reaches its largest cord length, and from there, in the second section, it again decreases in a roughly linear way. As a result, I can estimate the cord as a function of radius using two lines, aka a piecewise function. For this first section, I measured the rise over run to get the slope, and also measured the y-intercept. This approximates the cord length from a radius of 0 to about 0.029 meters. Then for the second line, I did the same. I measured the rise of a run to get the slope and then determined the y-intercept. This approximates the cord length as a function of radius from 0 0.029 meters on the blade to the end of the blade, which is at 0.17 meters. And there you have it. I've got all terms in the integral as a function of radius. As you'd expect, the three constant terms do not change with radius. Then the velocity term, which is velocity squared, is increasing exponentially. And lastly, the chord length, which is a piecewise function that when plotted looks like this, and when you overlay the actual image of the blade, it looks like it's a pretty good approximation. 
These terms are multiplied together in the original equation, so I'll do that graphically here first so you can see a graph of the lift force as a function of radius. Now to get the total lift of this blade, as mentioned, I'll integrate this function with respect to radius, which gets the total area under this curve. To get the actual value for this total force, I have to actually perform the integration, so let's plug in those terms that I solved for and get a number. I won't bore you with too much of the math, so I'll go through this quickly, and you can pause it each step if you want. The constants are fine as is, but I'll plug in omega times r for the velocity and square them both. Next, I need to plug in the piecewise function for the chord, but first I'll take out all the constants from the integral and plug in their actual values to make everything look cleaner. Next, I need to split the integral into two integrals with different bounds, so then I can substitute in the chord length lines for each. Plugging in those lines and then simplifying and I'm ready to integrate. Performing both of the integrations and then evaluating each and I'm left with some algebra so I just plug in all these values into a calculator and I see that the force of lift for a single blade is about 0.865 newtons. There's four identical blades on the helicopter so multiplying by four and I see that the total lift force of the helicopter is about 3.46 newtons. As long as the weight of the helicopter and the money is less than this lift force, it should accelerate upwards. Since the helicopter string and the paper clip were measured to have a mass of about 0.32 kilograms, that leaves about 35.1 grams for the dollar bills. Each dollar bill weighs about 1 gram, so it should be able to lift 35.1 of them, and that's how the line was set. I'll be adding 36, and if it can lift this, the over will hit, and if it can't, then the under will hit. Pause now to predict in the comments how reality will vary from this model. And now it's time to see what actually happened. With 36 single dollar bills attached, the helicopter did lift off, although I released the power a bit early so it wasn't super decisive, meaning I'll redo it with four more dollars to make sure it's decisive. With 40 dollar bills, the helicopter still easily took off, meaning the over has smashed the line. Congrats to those who got it right, and of course I still need to figure out the maximum it can lift, and when I tried to do this inside, it almost broke, and so I decided to move outside and use some wood blocks to help it launch better. Of course I tried out the full 100 single dollar bills first because of how easily it lifted the 40 and unfortunately at this weight the toy helicopter simply becomes a weed whacker. The same was true at 80 and 90, the helicopter just skims across the ground with probably some help from the ground effect and slowly falls to its death. Moving down to $50 and it was successful. Moving up to $60 and this appeared to be its maximum, it was able to hover right around the ground but couldn't go up beyond that. I was concerned the battery might be low after so many trials, so I charged it and tried again, and this definitely helped. I was able to lift $60 relatively easy, but I tried it again with $100 and had no luck. Trying with $80, and it technically did work, although it moved up so slowly, I'm definitely saying this is its maximum. So with a maximum of about $80, that's more than double what the expected line was. Let me know in the comments which factors you think contributed the most to this result. And yes, when I tested in slow motion, the battery was at full charge. If you want to support the making of more videos like this, consider buying me a coffee and don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching to the end and I'll see you next time.